good evening ladies and gentlemen on uh, behalf of eltai i welcome you all for this webinar 50 uh, titled literature and the new humanities reading ambais a deer in the forest uh, so before we um, uh, move on to the webinar i request you to watch a prom clip on eltai Uh, thank you for uh, watching the video. So now uh, I hand over the session to the moderator to take over. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. Good evening, one and all present here. I welcome you all to the Eltai webinar series 54 titled Literature and the New Humanities Reading Ambais A Deer in the Forest. The talk addresses the current role of literary studies in the humanities, drawing on Australian scholar Paul Donson's delineation of the new humanities as an interdisciplinary space and the reconceptualization of literary analysis as presentism and crisis critic. The talk considers the expanded scope and value of literature as equally cultural artifact and creative work that promotes liberal humanist perspectives within political context. To this end, it offers a critical analysis of Ambai's short story, A Deer in the Forest, as an example of presentism and crisis critic, and reflects on the continued relevance of, relevant, of literature in the new humanities. Now, I take the honor to invite and to introduce the speaker for today's session, Dr. Nishevita Jayendran. I welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Nishevita Jayendran is an assistant professor 
of literature and humanities at the center of excellence in teacher education tiss mumbai where she teaches and consults on language and literature literacy materials and curriculum design creative writing and discourse analysis she is the author of language education teaching english in india published by rotledge which looks at ways of building critical literacy in the language classroom nishevita has designed and runs a mooc on teaching literature strategies for short stories she has also mentored organizations in developing materials to sensitize adolescents on social issues like gender conflict and violence using a design thinking approach her publications span the domains of critical literacy and pedagogy literary criticism representation and cultural studies her current ongoing research is in the fields of literature and peace studies with this introductory note i cordially welcome dr nishevita jayendran to proceed with her talk now the platform is open to you ma'am thank you dr jayasudha thank you dr pradeep for those kind words and uh, i am indeed honored to be asked to talk on this platform today uh to really just situate what i was planning to do today i think it was a good preamble to look at the work that elta is doing because somewhere a uh, part of what i plan to talk fits into the literature model and uh, the way literature and the changing definitions of humanities in the current state of affairs within academia can reflect on how activities learning in the language classroom also can get expanded uh, i also felt this was an interesting point to initiate a debate really or a discussion on the role of literature in the humanities in light of the national education policy that came out last year and the uh, increasing emphasis that is being given to where and how to bring humanities into different kinds of academic spaces including science technology social sciences so it's not just about language learning it is really about rethinking spaces uh in that context i felt delving a bit on what literature means and what the new humanities means today would be an interesting starting point to get us to start thinking about these new spaces that are currently opening up and are th that are also going to open up in the coming years uh for this there has been a lot of debate internationally on the idea of the humanities and quite a lot of it has been going in that interdisciplinary direction of looking at humanities finding its feet in as varied disciplines as management studies as um as post colonial studies within gender um centers on gender development on discourses of say even global policy and uh, foreign policy international relations and this in fact is something that paul dawson talks about as not a crisis within the discipline but in fact the continued relevance of literature and the humanities in a wide range of areas so what i really propose to do today is to look at it along two lines in the first part of my talk i would like to touch briefly on the theoretical legacy of the humanities and literary studies in the space of humanities and how it is currently positioned within ongoing concurrent discourses on what humanities means and what literature can do within it after that i would like to take one short story by the tamil writer ambai the a deer in the forest this was originally published in tamil in 1994 in a magazine called kartel orman and eventually it has been translated by a huge range of writers two notable ones being lakshmi holstrom and ct indra very recently it came in a compilation of works uh, by katha and that is the specific translation by ct indra that i will be looking at so what i would uh, like to do is to unpack the story look at some examples of the different kinds of criticisms readings and approaches to the story that is enabled by this kind of a story a text and located within the context of the new humanities uh so to start briefly with the idea of the new humanities itself uh there is this very interesting reader that came out in 2005 by uh, a compilation of essays by richard uh, miller and uh, spellmayer 
who consolidated some 31 articles across a range of disciplines that covered everything from gender to foreign policy, economics, psychoanalysis, uh, aesthetics, and uh, even literary criticism, oral narratives, which they called the new humanities. And it makes one wonder where we are going. So if you're looking at a more theoretical legacy, we start with the 1950s and 60s, maybe even earlier with the Leibniz tradition of the liberal humanism, which looked at literature as this space of timelessness, of having eternal values and humanity as unchanging in its uh, various forms because it is something that is the best that we can teach to our students. And this approach of the 10 tenets of the timelessness of literature, of containing meaning within itself, of decontextualized close textual reading as an important component of actually promoting understanding of the world and individuals as possessing unique essences. You're celebrating the spirit of man almost from the time of the Renaissance humanism. And also that literature should not be propagandist. So you're not looking at didacticism. You're not really looking at a way of promoting ideas or uh, standing on a pulpit and teaching people, but rather a showing of demonstration of enabling people to discover values for themselves. Um, organicity uh, was another form and organicity related in a way to the idea of the timelessness of literature that reading it formally as a text was enough to give a meaning to what these stories meant. And this, of course, reflects in a way uh, with the way our own classrooms are when we're asking questions about what is the story about, what is the main uh, emphasis of this, what is the point of the story. All of these changed around 1950s and 60s with the introduction of postmodernism when we realized that knowledge is actually not just a given, but it is a conscious construct. So Lyotard's postmodern condition was one of those spaces where the idea of grand narratives was interrogated, it was challenged, and people were talking at smaller narratives of mini micro voices that are as important because those lives also matter. This was also the time where there was, uh, in the initial stages of the 20th century, when you had colonization, and finally people breaking free of colonization, a uh, recognition of the dangers of essentialism, a recognition of um, understanding that if you believe in a universal human essence, then there is a possibility of overriding alternate lifestyles and alternate belief structures. And out of this, the structuralist and the post-structuralist agenda grew, where they looked at how truth and power, people particularly like Barthes and Foucault and Derrida, Spivak with her subaltern studies, who used language as a cognitive framework to make sense of reality. and how this making sense of reality can impinge on our understanding and self-actuation. So the structuralist and post-structuralist uh, approaches were basically talking about how essentially identity is not fixed, unlike the liberal humanist tradition, but instead it was situated, it was fluid, it was moving. There is no way of attaining a complete essence at any point in time. Knowledge is political because it is con completely constructed at all points by power structures. We are imbued in ideology. And this was largely theoretical. It was abstract philosophizing. There was quite a lot of um, drawing on uh, linguistic theories, socios linguistics, which informed a lot of these ideas. It opened up the space of the humanities discipline in itself and liberal humanism to show that there could be dangers in essentializing. The Second World War proved their point. And this trend continued, but by the 1990s, 2000, we have reached a stage where there is this feeling that while we have made significant advancement in getting rid of essences and talking more about individualism, about voices of people from different genders, of different castes, of different sexual orientations, of different sections of society, different parts of the world, their voices are important and they count. So let us acknowledge them. There was also a sense that the abstract theorization was not really translating into praxis. And this is really where the negotiation between critical theory and the new humanities comes in. And this is uh, an ongoing kind of a dialogue that we currently see in the space of humanities and literature today. 
So when we move from the liberal humanism to the critical theories framework, we are looking at a shift within literature studies itself by the introduction of critical theory. But by the time we reach the 2000s and beyond and where we are currently, we are really looking at moves to synergize, to synthesize these ideas by not looking at humanism and theory as separate, but as one supporting the other. And this is in fact best represented by what the Marxist theorist Terry Eagleton talks about as crisis critique. It's interesting that uh, Terry Eagleton has been talking about Marxism and the classist ideological way of reading literature for so many centuries, uh, years. And now he reaches a point where he talks about it in his book After Theory, where he says that, you know, you have these ideas about society, but then we are also inhabiting an age of global pessimism. Everything that we have said or done all this time has already been said or done. Where are we going beyond? So what we really need to do is to use the knowledge we already have, the discourses of, say, post-colonialism, of feminism, of structuralism, of gender critique, peace studies, GCE, whatever we have to make sense of our world through texts. And this is what he calls an engaged kind of a criticism. Um, a lot of ways, literary studies is continuing to navigate these changing dynamics and these changing terrains because they are ongoing methodologies. So when I read a work, do I read the work for its own sake? How do I identify what discourses there are that underlie that work that makes sense to my reality? How do I do this without doing disservice to the work itself? And in this position, there is a situated reading that becomes important of contextualizing a work within a larger world, of contextualizing the work within its own self, and then making sense of it from my own perspective, because I may read into a work in the reader response way, a lot of meanings that make sense to me and that enables me to engage with it and be a more functional member of society. Now, these kinds of readings uh, are, are balanced on two very um, important critical and uh, tension-based ideas. One is the identity of the work in itself. What is it about? And the second is what the work is capable of doing. What can it do beyond the possibility of what it already is? What I would now like to do is to really take an example and the example being a short story, A Deer in the Forest by Ambai, and look at the way, unpack, maybe discuss different kinds of readings that a story, a short story of this kind can enable in me and in other learners and present maybe two or three examples of a situated reading as well as a crisis critique and see where it leads us. So very briefly to look at the plot, a deer in the forest is about a a woman, Tangamatai, who is uh, infertile, who cannot have children. And it is told from the perspective of this young child. It's a first person narrative and it's also an intradiegetic narrative. So the voice of the child is coming from within the text. And here is this young girl looking at Atai and, and not really understanding the mystery that surrounds this woman. This beautiful woman who tells her stories, who takes care of her, who is the heart of an entire South Indian Brahmin household brimming to the full with children who come there during vacations and who roll around frolic who's fed all the time it's this is this woman full of life and what is the mystery around her and the story slowly unpacks from the perspective of this young girl who Tangamatte is her her past and how she has moved from being a woman who never flowered, quote unquote, the term used in uh, the story to someone who comes to embrace her condition and then try and move beyond it. So the story was originally written in Tamil, like I already said, and uh, it has been translated into English. There are two exquisite translations available, one by Lakshmi Alstrom and the other by C.T. Indra. And the specific translation that I will be looking at in this uh, talk is the one by C.T. Indra, which was published by Katha. Uh, now, the story really moves in a way of giving a background to Tangamatte and her relationship with her husband, the way she takes care. And it ends with another story within a story, which is the story of a deer, a little story she tells the children. And this it's a story of a deer who gets lost in a forest, who comes alone and is scared. 
and it doesn't know what to do. And as it starts navigating, suddenly it starts seeing this, the beauty or rather she's, it starts getting used to the forest. And one day there is a moonlight and there is this little waterfall. It sees the beauty of the waterfall and feels maybe it's not that bad after all. And it comes to peace and it makes sense for itself within that forest and it becomes calm. The story ends in this manner. The question is, where does the, uh, the life and the story of Tangamate end there? Um, I would at this point like to look at a few select parts of the story and unpack it. So the one of the, um, the powerful elements of the story is in the simplicity of the language used. It is bare, it is direct, and it is, of course, told through the voice of a child. The use of the child protagonist is also a very important technique that is used because children see things and say things as they are. They don't think, they don't, I mean, they do, they do analyze it, but they analyze it in a very simple way. And the simplicity somewhere is what is required to bring out the power of discrimination, the power of injustice that comes up here. And this relationship between Ekambra Mama and Tangamata is a very interesting, intricate one that's unpacked through a set of completely matter of fact statements. The fact that he had another wife besides Atte. He had another wife beside Atte because she could not have kids and the family decides to get him married off. In the process, she drinks uh, and um, she drinks, uh, she grinds the seeds of the arali flower and tries to kill herself. She's barely saved. Ekambra Mama says, I will not do anything that will hurt you. And Atta then selects the girl for him. It's a very interesting play in dynamics of a Brahmin household of the assumptions. So it's not the story itself as much as what underlies those reasons. Why should Tangamate, uh, why should Ekambra Mama be um, married for the second time when Atta is already alive? It's not like he's a widower. The fact that fertility and ability to have children is a valued element of womanhood in Indian society and within the South Indian Brahmin household in particular is one indication of a certain hegemony of what we consider normal and acceptable within society. The fact that a Kambra Mama loves Atte enough to say, I will continue to be your husband and no one else's despite not having child is an indication of a not an aberration but of an anomaly because here is a man who's willing to go childless for his entire life perhaps also to navigate the spaces of ridicule that may come his way because he's not able to have a child because let's face it indian society is not kind to men either and there is this recognition in tangamate when she says when she recognizes his love and when she makes that sacrifice to be the second, the first wife, yes, but not the cherished wife. And then when she comes, she says, she, I live like a queen. My house is full of kids. Ekambra Mama's second wife had seven children. So obviously there is an establishing of his own virility of uh, Atangamata's own ability, inability to have a child. And the fact that she has welcomed that brood as her own. It's a very complex gendered uh, exploration of what it means to be a woman within Indian society told in a perfectly threadbare manner, but it captures at the same time the regard that these two human beings have for each other, the love they have for each other, and the sacrifice they're able to make for each other because they care as much. It's a beautiful coming together of that kind of a human essence of what human beings want the most. They want to be cherished. They want to be loved. What, irrespective of what the social structures allow them to be. Um, similar examples come when we, when the girl starts, when this child narrator starts unpacking the idea of what it means for someone to have not flowered. Again, note the interesting way in which words are played around with. Tangam, Ekamra Matimbe, for instance, here, he says he, uh, he treated Tanga Matai as he would a flower an object that has to be protected, that has to be cherished, that has to be taken care of because it's so beautiful and so vulnerable and powerful. To the next use of a word like flowered, which is about not about something that is hollow inside, not able to bear fruit. And this dichotomy is brought out beautifully and challenged 
it is interrogated and it is demanded that we look at it and reconsider because how can a woman who is so full of life with not a trace of wrinkle her hair is silvered yes but she is still complete she's still whole she is not like that withered tree that old tree that's been cut down with nothing in it she is the exact opposite of everything that they have seen and the juxtaposition of her beauty with this emptiness is a perfect counter to every discourse that defines what a beautiful woman should be like and in this case similarly we move into that third kind of a uh, of a narrative technique that amba uses in the story of a a story within a story and b a subplot now the use of stories and misona beams and little tales within the tale go right back to the panchatantra and the jataka tales where you're looking at embedded narratives and you're always reflecting on each other it makes it intertextual but there are different ways in which this intertextuality works a story within a story can either be a reinforcement of a primary idea that your larger narrative talks about alternatively it can be a challenging or an interrogation of that idea to say wait hey i'm giving you an alternate perspective do you really want to believe that it can also be a reflective statement that does neither and allows the reader to enter over here and this kind of a subplot that is used over here in this story is really ambiguous it's a beautiful story of a deer it is a narrative of this child quoting tangamatte so you're already looking at twice removed from the original narrative and here is tangamatte probably for all practical purposes supposedly unburdening herself and saying well you know one way of reading it is there i am that young deer that went in but is it really that is there something more than that with all fear gone the deer became calm is tangamatta really calm is it a wish fulfillment for her is it something is it a yearning that she has these are some questions the story leaves unresolved and the story the subplot as well as the larger story does not really provide an answer to any of these questions for the simple reason that it is something that one needs an effect of this kind of a narrative is that a reader is able to ask the questions a reader is starting to think about it and to question it now this is um, one of the places so far what i've tried to do and i've not really gone into the very very detailed um, analysis of the entire story for lack of time but what i've tried to do is to give some kind of an indication of how liberal humanist analysis would look like it would look at the structure of the work it would look at the way words come together the way stylistics and rhetoric work the narrative techniques that are deployed the kinds of narrative strategies used the genres used and your close textual analysis sort of stops there and it gives you a sense of okay here is a story that's making you rethink certain things once uh, we look at the new humanities perspective and we look at the coming of a situated crisis critique and we are starting to look at something like say uh, 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 a critical theoretical perspective the the text gets situated within these coordinates of the universe the author and the audience so i come to read the story in say the 21st century in 2021 i'm sitting here reading a story written in 1994 and identifying it with with it completely why how what do i bring to bear with it there is also the coordinate of the artist or the author who has written the story and the universe and now i would like to give one little example of how this kind of a reading would reinforce the politics of the text so um like i said the first time the story was written in tamil was in 1994 around the same time ambai as cs lakshmi was also publishing and writing several political pieces for the economics and public um, and political weekly this was within in 1993 and 94 there were two articles that came out which i found very interesting so the first article was in fact a critique of subramaniam bharti's verses and she she was then of course a uh, critique for her critique to say that she was being very rude and nasty to the man but her basic point in that critique was that you know bharati was still a patriarch he was not a feminist he was still looking at women as needing to be uplifted and uh, when ambai says that you know there have been times in the independence movement when women have been at the forefront of the struggle 
house was not, the private space was not the only space they occupied. They were in fact in the public right from the word go. They were leading revolutions. They were out there fighting against the British. So it's, it's absurd to say that the place of the woman is at home because it's never been that way. She, she pursues this idea in another critique of a movie called Parashakti, which came, um, which sort of um, was aired in the country around, I think, the 1950s or so. And there she critiques that particular movie to say that the presentation of a woman over there as a helpless woman who needs her three brothers to protect her from being molested and this and the minute her husband dies who's incidentally also appears to be an abusive husband he dies he leaves her with a child and she's struggling and finally those three wonderful brothers come and she becomes safe again um there are two points that ambai makes at this point when she analyzes the film she says that this is uh, not how women were about five years ago in 1947, till 1947 before. They were actually out there fighting against the British. There was So like I said, it was not really a private versus a public divide at all of men, men versus women, but they were all out in the public space. The second important point that she makes over there, which also has a relevance to the kind of other stories she writes, is the power of art to influence, to construct realities and to transform realities. When she, she says that as a movie, when a, mo a narrative of this kind enters a popular space, you are immediately expecting a certain cultural value to be followed by women. And that led to sociological studies that have been that talk about the way women were married off when they were young. They went, uh, the child marriage was something that was then finally revoked by the uh, by the law and the age for marriage of women was then gradually increased and they were then allowed to go and ha get an education so that they can become more independent. But these were in a way influenced by the narratives that these popular stories and the media, whether it's a film or a, a, a text that gets published in a magazine or the words that get passed on through proverbs, they make an impact to how we view life and how we treat the people around us. When seen within the context of this kind of a political position, the story that we see in A Deer in the Forest, as well as all the other stories that she writes about women, including the NGO she has set up now. She, she has been working in Sparrow for years, for decades, documenting the lives of these women who have not been spoken about. Her story like the squirrel is about a little squirrel that is coming the only um, inhabitor or the only kind of visitor to an old dilapidated library that contains archives of women's lives. And the, uh, a story like Yellowfish that talks about the bereavement, the, the pain of a mother who loses a child at, uh, at childbirth. It, it's not able to make it. These are smaller narratives. These are smaller lives that never get recorded in those grand narratives of history or in those larger events that change the world, so to speak. And here is Ambai writing those stories. So when she writes a short story of this kind, it is also an acknowledgement. It is a documentation. It is a validation of these smaller lives. And these situated texts, in a way, are the ones that bring together, that synergize those critical theoretical perspectives of discourse analysis, of critique, of interrogating, asking questions, probing further, and not taking essential values for granted with the element of morality, of spirituality, of pain, of love, of human values that a completely abstract reading and a political reading will not allow. What we see over here then is really an example of the way uh, theoretical frameworks as part of the world impinge on the reading. I would like to offer one additional reading of how this kind of literary transaction can make a difference to our approach to the humanities. Now, um, to just go back to where we started when I was talking about engaged reading and keeping in mind the fact that there can be what the story is about versus what it is capable of. So far, even with the situated reading of Ambai and her own politics, her own political positions, her own feminism and her sensitivity to the male, uh, to the male gendered experience as well. It's a balanced position. 
it is related to what the text deals with. In this slide, we are seeing an additional element that can be brought in that may not have been a part of the original idea, but that nevertheless is enabled by a work like uh, a deer in the forest. So when we look at disability studies, there are these two models of disabilities, the medical model of disability and the social model of disability. The medical model of disability would consider the individual as someone with a problem, there's some physiological, and you're, you're trying to solve that problem through medications by trying to get them to respond to medicine, surgery, whatever it is, but it is a physiological thing. The social model of disability, on the other hand, is a perspective that would argue that it is society that creates barriers to the individual from becoming fully functional. Now, this barrier can happen in a lot of forms. It can happen by having infrastructure that is, that is not sensitive to your needs. More importantly and more dangerously, it can happen through stereotypes. It can happen through discrimination. It can happen through gossip. It can happen to, to insensitive jokes and laughter. It can happen through non-inclusivity because you are not a part of say a cultural event, you are not allowed to come into a room, you are not allowed to hold on to another person's hand because of your ailment, your bad luck. These are emotional, psychological barriers that prevent you from being complete and from being from achieving those additional potentials that are already embedded within you. Now, in a story like A Deer in the Forest, we are able to see Tangam Atta as an embodiment of these two models. We see her as someone who's physically incapable of procreating. But what we see her actually fighting against is the psychological trauma and the psychological pain of having to justify her condition, of having to live with generations. So it's not just her generation. It's children like Valli and our narrator also who are party to this gossip. Stories are told about Tangamattai. Stories are told about how she's not able to be and have children of her own. And these are all in a way crisis critique, because when we look at humanism and when you look at new humanism, the kinds of themes that are dealt with, which include inclusion, which include international policy, it includes sustainable development goals. It includes um, something even as uh, huge as climate change. We are talking about ways in which literary works enable or enable a discussion, intervene and expand the scope of these fields by making it more humanistic because you recognize that at the end of it, along with those larger discourses, there are human beings involved. There are people who are suffering. There, a pandemic raging also has loss and tremendous loss at multiple levels. And we need to recognize, to be cognizant of those rather than merely blame people. This kind of an intervention is something that literature is capable of doing. It's a voice that literature brings into abstract dry spaces. It comes when we realize that there, after having told a story where this little deer becomes calm, Tangamata is sitting, in her midst, arms thrown across her bosom, palms clasping her shoulders and head resting against her knees. The question really is, has she found peace or has she made peace with her condition? Uh, I think I will stop here and maybe I would be happy to take questions at this stage. So thank you for your patience and I look forward to questions and I look forward to opening this up really to debate in a way because that is really the intent of what the humanities are capable of doing. What can we do in the light of, say, a new education policy that is saying that the language classroom, English language teaching, critical literacy and humanities needs to become an integral discourse and an integral language of education, not just at higher secondary levels and higher education levels, but even in schools. What will this kind of a classroom look like? So, um, yeah. that was a very stimulating presentation, uh, Dr. Nishevita. Before we move on to the question and answer section, let me try and sum up the key points of this presentation, starting with a quote. Literature forces readers to confront the complexities of the world, 
to confront what it means to be a human being in the difficult and uncertain world, to confront other people who may be unlike them, and ultimately to confront themselves. Dr. Nishevita stated that the present society need to synergize theory with humanism. She used a short story, A Deer in the Forest, to explain presentism and crisis critique through the characters Ekambaram Mama and Thangamatai with the kind of uh, love and sacrifice that they have for each other. Especially, uh, she talked about what the story is about and what it brings to you. It will not be wrong to say that humanity teaches what it means to be human in ways both good and bad. The humanities present us with humorous al numerous alternatives for behavior and the basis of choosing among them. Thank you. Now we have one question from our audience. Uh, it is by Dr. Lakshmi. She asks, what is the basic connectivity between literature and humanities in point of view of different genres? Over to Dr. Nishevita. Uh, so if I've understood that, the connection between literature and the humanities, uh, one of the things that has been happening both ways, in fact, Within the humanities, there has been an expansion in the kinds of texts that enter the field and that uh, that get defined as the humanities. So it's not just merely stories or creative works. There are also other essays. The essay has started making a huge comeback. Genres like travel narratives, travelogues, oral histories, there are a huge variety. In fact, if we just look at something as simple as the Nobel Prize or the Booker Prizes that are being given, a lot of autobiography, a lot of memoirs. Uh, 2012, um, Nobel Prize went to Svetlana Alexievich, and uh, uh, she was a Russian who was also a journalist. And her entire uh, documentation of the history of Russia in the form of oral narratives was what was given a Nobel for the monumental amount of storytelling that she had done. So there are multiple things that are happening, primarily being the play with words. So the idea of genre is no longer restricted to just fiction, non-fiction. It, it doesn't know a limit. There is, however, one characteristic element of humanities and the new humanities, which makes one particular work maybe superior than the other, and that would be the rhetoric used. So a largely humanities texts and literary texts of any value are non-didactic. They don't tell you. They demonstrate and they allow you, they unsettle you, they make you uncomfortable, they raise questions that need to be raised at human levels, at political levels, at multiple levels of human beings. And this can happen in a variety of genres. So it is a genre really then becomes a form through which uh, the content is carried. But what is also happening with the form is that each form comes with certain characteristics. So if I'm talking about a story, I'm necessarily talking about a like narrative, narrative, discourse. Uh, narrative discourse. And with the narrative discourse, I'm talking about plot, characterization, I'm talking about effect, I'm talking about catharsis, about wish fulfillment, uh, certain uh, those five elements of the plot of an exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. These come with or something like a narrative discourse. An expository discourse would be more scientific. It will be telling you facts. Like this is how it is. I'm not ex expecting you to agree or disagree. This is what it is. And the manner in which these different kinds of narratives, genres and discourse play out make a difference to how we receive texts and the effect it has on us. So a large part of uh, literature really to answer your question is that the genres are expanding and we do need to be cognizant of the amount of nonfiction that is entering the discourse. But that nonfiction is also on the borderlines because a large part of the nonfiction, uh, non-fiction uh, is narrative discourse. So when I decide to write a travelogue, I travel to Sikkim and I try to write a story about it. I'm narrativizing my life. So it's a balance between fact and fiction, but it is told in a particular manner. Uh, the literary analysis and the discourse analysis prospects in these areas would then involve being aware 
of the techniques being aware of the of the assumptions that come with different genres and also being aware of the scope of content in each work so a travelogue can also be a cultural artifact when you travel and you decide to eat a particular fo form of food you realize that food is integral to a community it is integral to a cultural practice and you're documenting it so how do you view it are you an outsider or an insider what is the tone of your narrative all these start making a difference to the actual representation of those experiences so with the new humanities there is really no uh, bounds or there is no real horizon to what can or cannot be included in the class but what is of import is the rhetoric the content and the thematic discourses that are being engaged and how they are being engaged with so in fact film studies for instance graphic novels it, it's a huge space now and interdisciplinarity has pretty much thrown it open to practically everything so um i hope that has answered the question or uh, if yes ma'am very well answered the next question is from professor mohan raj satuveli uh, he says a feminist literature is seen as a distinct genre in literature today where do we place ambai in this classification someone called her a kitchen feminist rather uncharitable what is your take on it i'm a little biased towards ambai so i don't have a take on any of those statements uh feminism itself has a huge very vast and very diverse history so an english uh, an american feminism is very different from a black feminism is different from french feminism post colonial feminisms have a completely different perspective and none of them are actually comparable um instead of answering that question directly i will just narrate an anecdote and leave it at that uh, there was uh, i had attended a conference where um, ambai was one of the speakers and she had narrated an incident from her life Uh, about something her mother had told her when she was young there was so she's like you know i was this feminist who really wanted to you know say that men, women are equal to men and so on and they were traveling in this little bullock cart at one point in time and one of the bullocks fell off and the cart didn't move and the mother kind of turned around at that point and said why do you think it's not moving which is like well one bullock is there how can the other one pull it she said precisely can a woman or a man alone pull the cart and she stopped there i think i will also stop here very interesting way to answer ma'am uh, the next question is from dr anita she says uh, the post pandemic would give way to new aesthetics especially naturalists so how humanity would coordinate with new ways of nature like eco criticism or maybe with new theories of existence um i am actually a little confused about the use of the term naturalist can there be an uh, explanation of the actual use of the term uh probably uh um to know so uh, yes no maybe i can just interpret that uh i don't really know how to answer that question for the simple reason that a lot depends on how we respond to the pandemic right now and what uh, how responsible we are so it's only a matter of how time will tell it's um, there are a lot of issues that have gone into it starting with internationalization globalization global travel connectivity so everything we take for granted and the fact that a webinar of this kind is even possible today is in a way partly contributing to the pandemic because we are able to connect across but it's because of this connectivity also and the ease of transport and the ease of science and technology sort of um becoming uh, so accessible and uh, so widespread that it has cut both ways i'm not sure whether we want to do an either or approach at this time but a little more responsible um use of technology responsible use of our resources it uh, um something that uh, david attenborough says in his uh, documentary on a life of the on the planet he talks about the use of solar energy and renewable energies 
to counter some of the challenges that the pandemic has posed and the climate change that we are currently facing, shifting away from fossil fuels, for instance. He's also been talking about enabling and building local capacities for a more sustainable development. So he gives the example of um, a, a location in Amsterdam, uh, in Netherlands, where they grow their own vegetables, not on earth, but artificially cultivated, but using solar technology. It's actually a wonderful documentary to look at, just to think through where we are heading and what we can possibly do. But uh, beyond that, I really don't know if I am in a position to answer that question. I'm really sorry. But it's a very good question. And I think it's a timely one because it does require us to become a little, hopefully a little more existentialist to rethink what it is we are doing, everything from education to our lifestyles and perhaps learn and be a little happier in the future. Yes, ma'am. A uh, next question we have uh, from Professor Ramani. Uh, he asks, how should the various perspectives on literature influence or give new directions to literary studies in the actual Indian classroom at the undergraduate level? Apart from adding the critical theoretical discourse among researchers and senior professors. Thank you for asking that because that is really in a way something that I feel we should be talking about to some extent. Uh, in the undergrad spaces, there are different kinds of courses that come in. So one, you're looking at a vanilla course like a BA or an MA in English, where the purpose is content knowledge. So you do want you people who enter this course are there to gain some amount of content knowledge in the field of literature. And with that, possibly go on to become future um, literature teachers. But one of the other things that is equally critical to do here is to enable them to, to, to sort of interpret by themselves, to locate, situate, and construct discourses, and most importantly, to become good, sensitive human beings. So to answer one of the previous questions also, our educational institutions have a responsibility. They have a huge responsibility to create future citizens that are non-judgmental, that are sensitive, that are empathetic, that care about themselves and their environment, and they are there to build a future for their children and our children together. You can do that in a literature classroom if you are in a position to enable that competence of critical literacy to develop. And what is critical literacy really? It's, it's about how we relate to our environment. It's about recognizing power structures when it comes in. And these are not as obvious as the RSAs that Althusser would talk about. The real power structures we need to be careful and cognizant of and fair towards are the hegemonic ones, the common sense ones, the jokes, the ones we take for granted, the ones we never question because, hey, that's normal. We, the literature classroom has the potential to enable these debates. So something very simple as perhaps a flipped classroom. I tell my students to read and I come and I have a discussion. And then at the end of the discussion, I give my teaching point instead of a lecture based mode. It took me a long time to actually change that mode myself because it, it's, it was easy to go into the lecture mode, but sometimes allowing them the space to speak, allowing them to talk about how they identify with the text. Sometimes even saying that I don't understand this at all, it doesn't relate to me at all, is an important point. Because what they really need to do is to figure out why we are reading this. What are the advantages of making sense of a text of this kind? How does it relate to my immediate environment? Am I able to empathize or not empathize? And why? Why is it that it connects to me or doesn't connect to me? And these kinds of discourses are actually an extremely important element that needs to be a part of every undergrad course, the critical thinking, the process oriented, the higher order skills of creativity and giving them maybe another um, Another technique that I sort of use in my classes is a portfolio. So I get the students, I require the students to write every week. So we, we have like these two or three themes we deal with in our uh, courses. And I tell them, okay, now I want you to have to look around you. If you're able to source an article from somewhere, if you've seen a movie that relates to this theme, if you have an experience 
that talks to this or doesn't talk to it. I want you to write about it and add a reflective note saying why you find this an important theme to engage with and why you found that incident relating or not relating. Those kinds of creative expressions and the spaces to voice their thoughts needs to come in because that is the only way we can make then interventions as mentors to give the feedback, to engage in dialogue and to really understand our students better. Otherwise, the purpose of it is really like a like the banking model that Freire talks about. You're there, the kids are there, we deposit something and they leave. It needs to be more dialogic. It needs to be praxis. And the real, um, the real change in a literature classroom comes when thoughts start getting refined, when ideas and an ability to think through situations and contexts become more and more nuanced. That nuancing is what is going to create that kind of a future crop of leaders and citizens in this country. So we do have a responsibility and that ability to think critically needs to enter more uh, in a more sustained way. We also do have a lot of humanities courses in places like IIM, TIS, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Currently, I offer a couple of courses as open electives to students at both the master's and the PhD level. IITs have these courses. Other universities, including uh, non-humanities, uh, in they do have these kinds of courses. But these are texts that can enter even a communicative skills class because you're working with a content and you're trying to get them to critically think about the content. So, um, again, I don't know if I've gone all over the place or... Yes, you beautifully <laughs> answered the question, ma'am. Uh, we have the next question from uh, T.H. Lawrence. He says, is it not true that the interpretation of a literary work determines how it is connected to humanities? Uh, I didn't get that. The interpretation of a creative work. Literary work. Literary determines work. how it is connected to humanities. It's a dialogic process is what I would say. That would have been one of the older ways of looking at it. So a liberal humanist perspective would probably tell you that if I'm reading, if I'm, if I pick up a text and I read it in like I, I see certain values within it and emotion within it, then I may then go and map it to a particular um, theory or a concept. What the new humanities and what the critical crisis perspective, uh, the crisis critique perspective would say is that it happens in a dialogue. So at the in the first um, uh, in the first uh, instance, and you are correct over there. The kinds of theoretical paradigms that you want to link that text too has to come from within the text. So I cannot, for instance, say that a story like A Deer in the Forest is a story about climate change because it has a forest at the end. That is an over-interpretation that doesn't even make sense. But I can definitely make some case or some kind of an argument for saying that it, it uh, uh, enables us to think about the experience of a person with disability. Uh, notice the way the statement is framed. It is not saying that the deer in the forest is a text about disability. It is saying that it enables me to think about it. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the responsibility onto myself. I'm locating one element within the text and I'm also locating it after reading the text in a holistic way because there is enough evidence from within the story to tell me that here is a story about the experience of a woman who is not quote unquote normal according to social standards. Now, this is where the dialogue comes in. And this is where that synergy and the synthesis of the liberal humanist and that theoretical per, um, perspective is brought together. So you're not prioritizing the one or the other. You are choosing specific kinds of humanities themes based on the story, but you're also enabling the text to go beyond just the words on the page because it can contribute a certain form of a knowledge, a humanistic knowledge, some kind of a message that the author may have embedded or wants you to engage with within the specific space of, say, a dry theoretical overview. So it has to be a dialogue. It can't be a one or the other in the new humanities perspective. very thought provokingly answered all the questions ma'am uh, with this we come to a stage where we need to propose the vote of thanks 
I am Sudha Singh from Anil Nirukonda Institute of Technology and Sciences. Take the privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the members of English Language Teachers Association of India and Vishakapatnam chapter. A big thank you to Dr. Nishevita Jayendran for her insightful presentation. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for excellent coverage on the topic, literature and the new huma humanities, reading Ambais, a deer in the forest. I extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Raghavendra, Dr. Swati Chikala, Mr. Achut, and Dr. Jayasudha of Eltai Vishakapatnam chapter. Further, we are grateful to the Eltai National Committee, especially Professor Ilango, Professor Ramani, Dr. Reddy, she Reddy Shekhar Reddy, Dr. Shravan, Dr. Xavier, and Dr. Praveen. A special thanks to Professor Mohan Raj for helping us organizing this session. Lastly, I express my sincere thanks to the wonderful participants and the members of the Eltai for showing up this evening. Thank you very much. I request Dr. Praveen to take over the session from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, both the moderators. Uh, it was wonderfully moderated. Uh, to the audience, the next webinar, uh, webinar 55, is titled Engaging Learners as Thinkers. The resource person will be Richard Harrison, uh, ELT specialist, founder and director of Canford Publishing, the UK and Oman. So I request the participants to participate in this session as well and benefit. One important information, the next week we don't have any webinar. So this is the next week. Thank you so much.